Happy Easter, everybody. So glad that you're here. Whether you have been here a long time or whether you're here for the very first time or something in the middle, we're really glad that you're here today. Hope you can just feel right at home. What I really hope is that you'll come back next week because we're going to do this series starting in next week that we're calling Resync. Because in the same way that we have to sync all our technology, it's true, we got to sync up our hearts and our souls and our minds with God because in the busyness of life, we get very unsynced, right? And so next week, we're going to start that new series just talking about some practical ways to reconnect our hearts to heaven. And I really hope that you'll be here um, as we start in on that one. But today, we're going to be looking in the New Testament, the Gospel of John. So you can turn in your Bibles to John chapter 11. If you brought your Bible along, if you would like to follow along and you didn't bring a Bible, you just raise your hand and the ushers will be glad to let you have one of those. And it's our gift to you. If you don't have a Bible, you can just feel free to keep that. While you're turning to John, and don't be afraid to use the table of contents if you need to use it. While you're turning there, um, I'll just tell you, I was thinking to myself as I was preparing for this weekend of the thousands of people who will be here this weekend. And I was thinking to myself about all the uniquenesses and all the differences, all the varieties of people who are here. Some of us, for example, are single who are here. Some of us who are here, we're married. Some of us who are here, we're separated. Some of us, some of us are divorced. Uh, Let's see, some of us like to get dressed up on Easter. Let's hear it from the dressed up people. There you are. Some of us are just grateful we got dressed. All right, so some of us are feeling a little extra holy today. Some maybe a little bit hungover. Some are agnostic. Some are atheistic. Some are Mormons. Some are Muslim. Some are Catholic. Some are Baptists. And we actually have a lot of people who get married that are Catholic and Baptist, and they call Faith Bridge the middle. And here you are today. So we're really glad that you're here. But despite all of the differences, all of the varieties of so many people here today, it's occurred to me that there's one thread that runs through all of us. Every single one of us has at least this in common, and that is sooner or later in life, there's going to come a time, or maybe it has come, or maybe you're in it right now, when there is some pain, there is some hardship, there are some rough times, some suffering that comes to life. It's unavoidable. Now, why would I bring this up on Easter? I'll tell you why I bring it up on Easter. Because especially if you're in a fragile or broken place, I believe it's very easy on an Easter weekend when everybody around is looking nice and has their smiles on to feel a little bit out of place and to sort of feel like, you know what, I just, I don't want to be the party pooper, but I I really, I'm kind of hurting on the inside. I'm carrying a burden, carrying a stress. This, I'm in a rough patch right now. Maybe, for example, um, a doctor recently told you or a loved one that it was the diagnosis that you were praying that it wouldn't be. Or maybe you're in a job situation that's very uh, precarious. Or maybe you're in between jobs. Or maybe you're facing some, some serious financial strains that are very frightening to you right now. Or perhaps... You got a phone call from your your, your child's principal or teacher, and it wasn't to tell you he made the honor roll, but there's a real problem that you need to talk about. Maybe maybe you were a victim of, of Hurricane Harvey seven months ago, and seven months later, you're still not feeling back. You're still climbing out, and you're still, you're just feeling worn out from it all. And it's easy when we are in these types of seasons for us to say, God, why are you letting this happen to me? What's going on? We tend to have these kind of conversations with, the, with, with God, right? Where we're like, God, you know, I just feel like I'm kind of down here on this end trying. Uh, you know, I'm trying to do my best. I'm trying to live for you. You know, it's exactly whatever that means. And, you know, I have been in church a little bit lately. I feel like I'm coming through for you, but you're not coming through for me. And when we are in that frame of mind, it's very easy for us to grow disappointed with God. To grow confused by God and wondering, where is he when it hurts? Well, this really isn't anything new. 
It's something that people have wrestled with for centuries. In fact, I was thinking about this passage that we're going to look at, and it occurred to me, this is precisely the very thing that was going on in these characters' lives several thousand years ago in the days of Jesus. Let me give you the context before we look at the passage. Okay, so there was these three people, Lazarus and his sister Mary and Martha. And they were really good friends uh, of Jesus, and they lived in this little suburban community, I guess you could call it, of Bethany, about two miles south and east of Jerusalem. And whenever Jesus was passing anywhere near Jerusalem, he would always stay with Mary and Martha and Lazarus because he just really enjoyed friendship with them and just felt so at home when he was there. He could relax. And you know, and you'll probably have a place like that. When, when you're there, it just feels right with your soul. You can unwind. You can relax. The food's good if there's food. There's laughter. There's fellowship. There's happy memories. It's just like it just feels good to be in that place, right? And that's what Mary and Martha and Lazarus' place was like whenever he was near Jerusalem. Now, this is the context that we're going to see as we go into this um, passage. We're also going to discover, though, in this passage that Lazarus was sick, like really sick. This is the problem. Like, Like the doctor shaking his head and saying, I wish there was something more I can do, kind of sick. I got nothing. And so they're desperate at this point. This is the context when we come in uh, to the story. And we see that they, uh, they, they send word, Mary and Martha do, to Jesus off in another village wherever Jesus was at that point. In verse 3, it says, Lord, the one that you love is sick. I think it's significant that they say, the one that you love, is it they don't even call him Lazarus. There's like... We know how much you love us, and we love you, and we're just like such good friends. You don't even need to call him by name. And, but he's sick, like bad sick, like you need to come and you need to do your thing here. They've seen him do it before. They've seen him heal plenty of people, right? They probably even saw him heal some people that they're like, I don't even know really if I would have healed that person if it was up to me. But, you know, he's, they've seen Jesus do all of these healings. They're like, he's, he loves us. Of course he's going to come and heal Lazarus. It'll just be maybe a couple hours, and he'll probably be here, and they'll take care of it. That's why verse 6 is really confusing when you come upon this. Let's look at it. It says, so when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. What? One scholar says this ranks up with the most startling cause and effect passages in the whole Bible. It it doesn't make any sense. Jesus loved Lazarus, therefore he stayed put. That doesn't make any sense. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard for me, at least. I'm kind of a type A, hard charging kind of person, and and so if somebody contacts me because they're having a hard time and there's something that I believe that I could do to help them, I'm going to come through on my end and I'm going to help them to do that. Jesus doesn't come. He stays put while everybody's freaking out in Bethany. He's hanging out in another village. (laughs) You know, and you're like, what's going on here? Which highlights, I think, the first thing that we need to see from the passage um, today. And that is sometimes his plans, his methods, his timing are just very different than what we would prefer. And that can be really confusing. It can be really frustrating in fact, for, for you, especially if you're going through a really hard season right now, you're carrying a grief of some sort. It's, it's just, I can't tell you how, how many people have said, you know, why is this happening, Pastor Kid? Oh, I wish that I could tell you why. But I gave up a long time ago trying to say, here's why. And the truth of the matter is you should probably stay clear of anybody who says, oh, I can just tell you exactly why all of this is happening. Now, I'll be the first to acknowledge that there are times that you can see God's clear hand, and you can see the why. Usually, it's in hindsight. Like, maybe you didn't get married to somebody, and then years later, you look back, and, and from where you are now, you're like, oh, thank you, God, that I didn't get married to that person, and I'm this, and, you know, it just worked out so great, and thank you, God, and, you know, or maybe you didn't get a job, or you, maybe you got fired from a job, and you're, and you're like, what's going on? But years later, you look back, thank you, God, for getting me out of that place, because now look where I am, and it was just, a, you know, or maybe you go to the medical 
center because you think you're making a pastoral visit and you find out that God had you there because you were going to die and you needed to be there that very day. So I'll be the first to acknowledge there are these times that you can look back and say, whoa, I see what God was doing. But let's also be honest enough to say that there are times that you can't, we can't. Even with the passing of time and the crying of many tears, even sometimes years later, we look back and we're still like, God, I still don't really see the why. I mean, I know in general broad terms that God is great and sovereign and providential and he works all things. You know, and I I know that he's in control and, and he's got his grander plans. But sometimes those plans and his purposes, his timing, his methods... They're just confusing. And that's exactly where Mary and Martha were. Because when they needed Jesus most, he wasn't showing up. Now, he does eventually get to Bethany. After Lazarus is dead, he's been dead four days, it says. And at this point, when he pulls up, Mary and Martha, they're surrounded by family. They're all grieving and crying. And and somebody says, hey, Jesus has just gotten here. And so it says that Martha got up first, and she went tearing out to Jesus. And then Mary got up and went out after Martha. And then the crowd got up after Mary. And so they all go out to find Jesus. And it's interesting. Mary and Martha both say the very same thing to Jesus. You see it in verse 21 and verse 32. They both say the very same thing. They say, if you had been here My brother would not have died, Lord. I like the way that the New Living Translation says it. If only you had been here. If only you had been here. Now, you have to capture the pathos of that. You have to to picture these ladies just in their hearts. They're sobbing as they're holding on to him. And they're saying in between their sobs, if only, if only, Lord, I think a lot of us have our own if onlys. If only I had said, I love you. If only they'd been a faithful spouse. If only I'd had a better mom or a better dad. If only I'd said, I'm sorry. If only I'd made a wiser choice. All of us have these if onlys. But the good news on Easter is that in Jesus, we actually have someone that we can take our if onlys to, who specializes, who's in the business of taking all things and working them together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes, Jesus. And that's where Mary and Martha are taking their if onlys. They're taking them straight to Jesus, which I think is what makes verse 35 particularly important. Perhaps one of the most important verses in the whole Bible. Verse 35, it says, Jesus wept. Now, when I was a kid, I remember two things about this verse. The first thing I remember about this verse is whenever you were in a Bible memory class, this was a good little verse to have up your sleeve in case you fell behind because you're just like, I'm going to go ahead for this one and take John 11:35. Jesus wept. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, so that's convenient. But I also remember as a kid thinking to myself, that makes no sense. Why is he bothering taking the time to weep? I mean, he could just say, hey, ladies, check this out. Ta-da, and and just do his thing. Why is he doing all this weeping thing? Ah, now that I'm older, I understand. There's a very profound theological statement and signal that's being sent to us. And that is that Jesus, who is fully God, but also fully man, in becoming fully man, entered into our world of suffering, of pain, of trials, and he takes all onto himself and bears those pains and those sufferings into himself. He shares in those pains and suffering. You know, having children really helped me to understand this because after I had children, I noticed that something had happened. I'd noticed that it was like this chain had been formed between my heart to my kids' hearts. 
And when things are going well with my kids, it seems like things are kind of going well with me. Even if everything around me is not going so well, it just still feels kind of good because I know the kids are doing, the kids are doing well. On the other hand, this little chain I've noticed does this. When one of them is in a rough place or having a hard time or troubled or, or worried or upset about something, I notice even if everything in my life is growing great, it doesn't feel so good inside my heart. Why? Because my heart is bound up with their hearts. I just feel that. And that's the signal that he's sending to us here. Jesus is. Because those two words, Jesus wept, are telling us his love is so great for us. In fact, Tim Keller says, so great is his love for us that he can't even judge us without it breaking his heart. You see that in Hosea 11 where it says, my heart will not let me do it. My love for you is just too strong. So if you ever wonder, does God care about me? Does he love me? Hear this on Easter. Oh, yes, he does. He does. He loves you enough to weep over you. And, and that's significant that he weeps because we, we only weep about the things that matter to us, that we identify with, right? For example, if after the service today, we were to shake hands and meet for the first time out in the atrium or maybe go to a party on the patio uh, and spin the wheel and get your prize and, and that sort of thing if you're, if you're brand new here, and I hope that you will go there. So, but suppose we met, and suppose that you said, hey, I, I just need to tell you something. Um, my child is really having a hard time and, and going through this, and you know, I'll probably listen as caringly as I can and say, hey, let's say a prayer for him, and, and we'll do that right there on the spot. But I, I'm not going to collapse and fall into your arms and start sobbing. Why? Because we just don't know each other that well yet, and, and, and I, I, I can't identify with your, your feelings and with your pain at that level. Not yet I can't. Now, on the other hand, I can tell you about a time when I sobbed with my boy and over him several years ago when he was in third grade due to an act of domestic violence. So it happened not at school, but it happened at home. His third grade teacher was shot and killed. And the next day, he walked into school with all his classmates and sat down, and those children had no idea what they were about to hear and why there were so, why there were so many adults standing around the room. And just like that, everything was different. Oh, he sobbed. And we sobbed with him. We sobbed for him. We sobbed with him. We laid in bed for weeks, many a night with him after that. Why? Because we couldn't help as mom and dad, but, but just to feel what he was feeling. And we, we were feeling it ourselves because our hearts are inextricably tied up with those whom we love. And so find this, see this. In Psalm 56, it's so significant that, that God is saying, look, I have put every one of your tears in my bottle. I know how many tears have been down your cheek. God says, I know more about your pain and your distress than you do. So we may not understand why what's happening is happening, but we needn't ever question, does he care? We needn't question that. We needn't question, does he love me? Oh, yes, he does a thousand times. Yes, He doesn't just hold us and weep with us in our pain. He also speaks powerful words of life and hope to us. And so let's look at what he says to Martha in verse 25. <clears throat> These are verse, this is a verse you've probably heard at any number of funerals. Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Now, this is an important verse on Easter because this is a staggering claim that Jesus is making to say, I am the resurrection and the life. Who would say that if they, if they couldn't actually? I mean, think about it. If I stood up here and I said, hey, I just want you to know, happy Easter. I, Pastor Ken, <laughs> am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, you will live forever. What would you do? I know what you would do. Some of you right back there, you'd be like, okay, bye-bye. You know, and <laughs> others of you would like call the little guys in little white coats and take them off to the nut farm because something's gone wrong here. Nobody in their right mind would say that unless they really were 
That's why Muhammad never said, I'm the resurrection. That's why Buddha didn't ever say, I'm the resurrection. No major world religious leader ever came along and said that, but Jesus said it. Which must mean he's either out of his mind or he really is the resurrection and the life. Now notice he says, he doesn't say, <clears throat> someday there's going to be a resurrection. Someday I'm going to resurrect uh, Lazarus. He doesn't say, in a few weeks I'm going to be resurrected, as a matter of fact, uh, Mary and Martha. No, he says, wherever I am, there is resurrection. Wherever I am, present tense, there is life. In other words, wherever I am, watch out. There's life flowing right now. It's coming from me to you. So let me ask you the question that he asked to Martha that day. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he is the resurrection and the life? And specifically, do you believe that for you? The pronoun's really important because it's one thing for if you come in here and you say, oh, yes, 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 I know about Christianity and Jesus came from heaven and he um, was born and he lived a perfect life of sinless perfection and, and then he died on the cross and for our sins and, and uh, then he was buried and then he was resurrected and then he went back to heaven and someday he's coming back. I, I get it, I get it. Well, if you said that, you would be correct. But I would say, I don't think you got it. It's all in the pronouns. But here's the difference of this. When a person says, oh, Jesus was born for me. <laughs> and he lived a sinless life for me. And he died on a cross for me, and he was buried and resurrected and ascended back to heaven where someday he's going to come again for me. Now you're getting to the nub of it. Now your pronouns are saying, I think I'm stepping into life because it's becoming personal for you. So I ask you again, is he the resurrection and the life for you or just for some other people out there somewhere? That's the question on Easter. So let's get to the, uh, to the climax of the story here. After this, it says in verse 38 that Jesus walked towards the tomb. And it says, as he walked towards the tomb, he was deeply troubled. One translation says he was angry, which begs the question, what is he angry about as he's walking to the tomb? He says, he's not angry at the women, is he? No, he's not angry at the women, not for their grieving. But two things uh, scholars point out. One thing that he's angry about is death itself. Because as he's walking to this tomb, don't you know going through his mind, he's thinking to himself, this was never what I had in mind at the beginning. I never had death in the plan. In the beginning, he created this world to be sin-free and violence-free and suffering-free and death-free. So don't you know he's walking to the tomb? You, you've had this experience yourself. When you go to a funeral and you look in the casket and you're like, oh, it's just not right. Everything inside of you is like, it's not right. You know deep down it's not. No, it's not right. That was never what he created things to be. But we also know that in the beginning, our spiritual parents shook their fist at God. And they said, we want to do it our way. We want to live according to our plans. We want to live according to our will, not your will. And at that point, everything broke. And sin gushed into the world. And it only seems to be gushing more and more. So we know that when he was walking towards the tomb, one of the things that was troubling him was just death itself. But we also know that there's another thing. The other thing that was troubling him was as he was getting near that tomb, he's calculating, I know what this is going to mean for me. Let me explain. If you haven't read the Gospel of John through, you should read it. It's, it's not very long, and it is very interesting. And <clears throat> what you'll discover is that the miracle he's getting ready to do right next is going to be his last and his greatest miracle before he goes to the cross and is crucified and everything several weeks later. Something, maybe it was just a week or so later. So this is going to be the, the culmination of his ministry at this point, which means 
Jesus knows that the religious leaders who already hate him, they hate him because he's been dwarfing their crowds now for a couple of years, and they're just out to get him everywhere he goes. He knows, if I do what I'm getting ready to do with Lazarus, and I bring him out of the jaws of death, he was calculating it's going to be my life next. I'm hurling myself into the same jaws of death. So he's troubled because he's calculating I'm going to do a wonderful thing for Lazarus, but it's going to set in motion like dominoes the end of my ministry and the fulfillment of the mission for which I've come. No more waiting around. The time is now. So he's troubled because he knows this is what lies around the corner for him. But he doesn't shrink back from it because he knows the mission for which he came. It wasn't just to try to help people feel a little bit better from their sore throats and their sniffles. He was like, no, no, I've come to dive into the deepest part, to the bottom of the barrel, to take out the worst of the depravity, the worst of sin, and that is death. To take out your biggest problem, eternal damnation. I'm diving to the bottom of the barrel so that I can eliminate that for you. And so he's going to hurl himself into those jaws just days from now. So the story gets really exciting at this point. He says, roll away the stone. And Martha says, Lord, um... He's been in there four days now, and it's going to be really smelly, which I think is, is so funny that, that John just gives us this very pedestrian detail. In fact, sometimes people say, how can you trust the Bible? I'm like, how can you not? If you were writing a melodrama, you would not put that sort of detail into it. But he's putting everything that happened. And Martha, we know from another account, she was a meticulous hostess. She was a little bit like Martha Stewart. And so she cared about things like odors. She's like, no, I don't know if you're really rolling a roll of stone away. It's, it's going to be really smelly. But I tell you what, there is a significant point that we can draw from that. And it's this. Sometimes Jesus does his greatest work in our lives after things have gotten really stinky. And that's good news on Easter, isn't it? Now imagine the drama of the moment. Everybody stopped their crying. Everybody standing still. The stone is rolled away. And then in verse 43, Jesus says, Lazarus, come out and Lazarus comes out of that grave he's been dead for days so if you're a princess bride fan that's dead dead and he comes out of the grave And one scholar said it's a good thing that Jesus called Lazarus by name. Otherwise, all the dead people would have walked out at that point. And he'd be right because wherever Jesus is, there is life. Wherever Jesus is, there is resurrection. He says, Lazarus, come out. And he does come out. Now, we know, of course, that this isn't the ultimate resurrection story in Scripture because, like I said, A week or two later, Jesus himself is going to be arrested on trumped-up charges because at this point, the Pharisees are going to go over the top green with envy, and they're going to say, enough, that's it. We can't stand anymore. Now he's raising people from the dead. We can't control this guy. We can't compete with them, that's for sure. So we'll just make up false charges. We'll get them arrested. We're going to get them crucified, dead, and buried. we got to get rid of this guy. Jesus brings Lazarus out knowing this is what's going to come for me next. But Jesus is going to do his own resurrection. It's as if this was sort of the practice run through, almost a sampling, almost a foretaste of what he was going to do for us when he would hurl himself into the jaws of death and do the struggle with us. Well, not with us, but with our enemy as our substitute. It's where he would then come out of that grave triumphant and conquering once and for all our problem of death, signifying to all who tether themselves to Jesus that death will not be the final word for us because Jesus is where 
life begins. Which is why it kills me when I hear people say, yeah, you know, I don't really want to open my life up to Jesus because I'm afraid if I open up my life to Jesus, then, you know, he'll kind of want to take over and I'll miss out on so many good things and so much fun and all this kind of stuff. You could not have it more backwards. The truth of the matter is when you let Jesus in, that's when, you're, that's when you actually will come alive. When you let Jesus into your life, that's when the broken parts will come together. When you let Jesus into your life, that's when the decay stops. That's when real purpose, real transformation are found. That's where life begins. But look, you don't have to take it just for me. You'd expect me to say that, right? If you're thinking about it, take it from Daniel, one of our young adults, who somewhat recently told us his story, and we said, everybody should get to hear that story because it's such a, a great story of God's work in a person's life. Take a look at the screens. My name is Daniel, 25 years old. Uh, I've grown up in Spring, Texas my entire life. I've been going to Faith Bridge for about nine years, but I only really started following Jesus nine months ago. Most of my life was pursuing happiness. I saw money buy things, and when you get things, you get happiness. So it's like, okay, money's the, the goal, because with money, then all these things play out. Wasn't making any near amount of money I wanted to, wanted to make. Um, didn't feel accomplished. Didn't feel like there was anything I could hang my hat on. Uh, so in return, I felt like a failure. So that put me on the path of seeking love in relationships, in romance. All I knew in relationships was, you know, you should just do what makes you happy, right? Essentially, the joy I kept finding in a new person, it's just like a fleeting emotion. Just something that was a mirage that, you know, I could see in the distance and as you keep chasing it, you never arrive. I used alcohol to just, drink away the pain. Um, when the day just became too much, I would just drink it away. But eventually, it took too much, it took too, too much time to do and I turned to pills. There's, there's a gaping hole inside of you and you can find a quick fix, but it, just as quick as you get it, it goes away. Not really knowing where to turn because I had accepted Christ at nine, um, so I kind of had this false sense of security that, well, I've got God but I had no idea who he was. Um, here I am proclaiming him to be my Lord and Savior for 16 something years, but the truth of the matter was, I didn't know him. I didn't know I have a clue. I had come to the conclusion that like there was no way out and I, I, was, I couldn't keep lying. I was filled to the brim with lies. Lies about my drug addictions, lies about my past sexual history, lies about stealing money from the business, just lies about having it together. You know, like it wasn't okay to be broken. That's what it seemed like to me. Like I don't get why anybody keeps living their life because it doesn't make sense. That darkness is like nothing else. You, you don't know who you are. I mean, you're lost. You're dying and the worst part about it is you don't even know why. You think you know God. You know, and you got 24 years and there's no, nothing to, to show for it. Nothing. It, it's a joke. I mean, it's all meaningless. I don't know how to explain it. All I know is something broke inside of me. My last Hail Mary was a cry to God. I didn't know what to pray about. I didn't know what to say. I was begging God to show me he was real. Just show me something, that he cared, that he loved me, that I was worth something to him. God laid something on my heart telling me, I, I know where you're at. Like, I, I know you, I, I know what's wrong. All I saw was Christ. All I saw was his death on the cross. That's really all I focused on, you know, was why did he die on the cross? And it comes down to one thing, it's love. He loves you, he loves me. That's where it, it finally clicked for me. I was like, wow, he, he loves me. The weight went away. 
that crushing weight that's like on your back to perform, to, to you know, succeed in life, to make a name for yourself, it all, go, it all went away. For me, the change, the transformation uh, was overnight. Uh, I was not the same person the next day. The best way I can describe it is I got a new heart. I've got a new heart and a new mind. I was totally transformed. There was a hope inside of me that had never been there before. There was a love for people that had never been there before. Um, the draw to abuse and use drugs and women, it was gone. It was, it was gone. It wasn't there anymore. Um, I felt no urge to chase that lifestyle anymore. I finally felt free where like, I didn't have to keep everything in anymore. I, I didn't have to hide anything. For me in my life, he's put me on the path of loving people from a sacrificial standpoint. And that set me on this journey of pursuing him. And as I've pursued him, I've just fallen more in love with him. I was dead in who I was, but my life began when I fixed my eyes on the cross. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome that I just love hearing a story of somebody who is honest enough to just say, hey, here's what the Lord has done in my life. And you know, the, the reality is there's any number of people here today who could say, you know, my story's not that story, but he's done a work in my life as well. In fact, if you've never said yes to Jesus, you should ask whoever invited you, whoever brought you, to tell me what has he been doing in your life there's Christians gathered all around the world, millions, many of whom could say, I can tell you my story of what he's done in my life. I'll guarantee you this, if you would open up your life to Jesus and to the life, and the resurrection power that he wants to flow into you, I guarantee you this, Though your circumstances, the circumstances of your life, they may not change one bit, but everything inside of you will be different. Everything will be different. Because we serve a God who promises to meet all of our needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And it only makes sense, doesn't it, that if he can take out our worst enemy, death, that then you can back up from there. He can take out the lesser things. He can give us supernatural power that we need for dealing with our marriage issues, for dealing with our parenting issues, for dealing with our self-esteem issues, our job issues, our financial issues, our drug addictions, or whatever other addictions that we have. He can, if he can take out death, our worst of all fears and enemies, he can take out all the other things. So let him into your life. Open up your soul to him. Surrender your will to him. Put your trust in him. Confess your sins to him. Cling to his forgiveness. Make him the leader of your life. Give him your heart. Give him your all. You may have come in here with a stagnant soul today, but the good news of Easter is you don't have to leave with a stagnant soul you could walk out of here with a resurrected soul because life begins with Jesus. Amen? Amen? So open your heart to him. Let's pray right now. Lord, my prayer is for every person who is here because I know that we have people all along the continuum. Some are here and they could say, and should say even right now, thank you, Lord, for what you've done in my life. We just stop and just say thank you on this Easter. Because I'm, I'm, I'm living with you in my life. I'm coming daily to know more about you. And I just say thank you. Others, though, you're here and you're saying, you know, I don't think I've stepped into that circle. I don't think it's ever become resurrection and life for me. And today, I want this Easter to be my Easter. I want life to begin for me today. So if that's you, friend, I just invite you right now in the, si the quietness of this moment just to, you can just borrow these words that I'm speaking aloud. If they can help you, something like just saying, Jesus, 
I'm asking you to come into my life. I am asking you to flip the switch on in my soul. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of unrighteousness. Fill me full with hope and with the power of your spirit. Won't you flow into me? And teach me what it means to live for you and to have purpose for which you created me in the first place. Today's my Easter. Today I'm stepping across the line. I'm ready. I'm saying yes, Jesus. Others of us, you're, you're here and you say, you know, I, I, I prayed a prayer like that some years ago, maybe five years ago or 10 or, or longer. But maybe if you're honest, you would say even right now, you know, oh gosh, I've gotten far away from that. Maybe your prayer is something like, Lord, I want to come back. I need to come back. I'm ready to come back. I'm back. I'm stepping back into the circle. I'm saying Easter is my day too. I want to turn around. I want to quit doing it the way I've been trying to do it. I need your hope. I need your power. I need your strength. I'm asking you to come into my life with your supernatural resurrecting power right now. Today's my Easter as well. We say thank you, Lord, for the work that you're doing in many people's hearts. This weekend, we're grateful and we just pray all of these things full of expectancy, full of confidence, full of the assurance that comes through you and through your strong name, Jesus. Amen.